fundraising. And yeah, as you say, I mean, this is this is much less uplifting and um, than Natasha's talk, but it does have resonance with both uh, Justin and and David's David's talks from earlier because it, this is a subject which is fraught and obsessed with class and the ranking of people, and and also um, is is synonymous with the birth of modern statistics as well. I've got slides because. That's what scientists do. So let me let me share my screen with you. So the, the, the concept of eugenics is most closely associated with um, the, the, the atrocities of, of the Nazis. But in fact, it has a much deeper and longer history than that and it is something that has been with us from our earliest works in at least the Western canon. Plato describes a form of eugenics back in, in Republic. Um, but um, this gets over the idea uh, the, 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 what I'm interested in, because I approach this subject as a scientist and as a geneticist, is the idea of eugenics, the formalization of the idea of population and birth control. And the, the, as you say, Rosie, the weeding out of undesirable characteristics. And the Adam, I can't see your slide. I'm no, sorry. No, that's because it was a blank slide. But thank OK, you. that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Um, and in fact, the formalization of this whole idea starts in the 18. Uh, the late 19th century with Francis Galton, who was also a Quaker, another link with, with Justin's talk there. But I'm not going to talk about him um, so much as the one of the most significant countries that adopted uh, eugenics as policy, which is the United States, and then ultimately its influence on the pathway to the Holocaust. What, what I'm really interested in is not just the presence of, 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 of eugenics in our uh, to today, the legacy of this what has become a toxic idea, but how a small sort of esoteric scientific idea becomes um, policy and ultimately becomes genocide in just a few decades, the sort of idea of a, a ripple in the pond. This is Francis Galton, the guy who comes up with the idea, the cousin of Darwin, uh, enamored with Darwin's work on natural selection, figures that we can apply the same principles of artificial selection, such as farming to humans and thus uh, improve the quality, the quality of people. This is a sort of version of his definition, which which comes a bit later. Um, but I want to switch to America but, and, and talk fundamentally. Oh, sorry. On, uh, one idea that is absolutely essential in the, the, the theory of eugenics as it emerged in the 19th century was that there are individual genes for individual characteristics and that these would determine our life. So it's the nature versus nurture question, which was, in fact, formulated by Galton in the 1890s. And the eugenicists believed very much that there were individual characteristics which we were wedded to. And if you had that version of the gene, then that is how your life would turn out. Now, it, it, it in fact turned out in the 20, late 20th century with the Human Genome Project that this model is just not very good. It's not accurate. It's not how we describe genes at all. However, that hasn't made it true to the popular view. And here's just a selection of headlines from the last 10 years from a selection of papers where we reiterate this idea, this specious idea that a single gene will influence you in all sorts of complex ways. A gene that'll scare you out of your mind, make you take risky decisions, will make you happy, transsexual, make you politically left. I, the bottom center one, I don't even know how that would work. A gene that predicts what time of day you will die. Um, but uh, there you go. And this model is, is just incorrect. It's just not how human genetics works. And yet it is absolutely pervasive through our, our culture and our understanding of how biology interacts with behavior, interacts with society. It was so fundamental to the eugenics movement. I'm going to switch to America now and introduce Charles Davenport, who's the sort of equivalent of Francis Galton in America. In fact, met Francis Galton in the 1890s and transported and developed his ideas. I'll talk about H.H. H. Goddard in, in, in just a minute. But Davenport founded the eugenics research office at what is now Cold Spring Harbor, one of the greatest laboratories in, in the world. And in it, he tried to formulate and promote the idea that eugenics was both good for society and would help shape our or cure our social problems. But it was also something that he was obsessed was about was collecting pedigrees of people so that if you could work out the patterns of inheritance, just like Mendel and his peas a few years earlier, if you could work out the patterns of inheritance in families, then you could determine their characters and therefore you could identify the things that you wanted to enhance 
and the things that you wanted to remove from society. So this is a photo of a Charles Davenport in the front row with a pointy beard. And he what part of what the eugenics research office did was train up people to go out into the field, particularly into rural areas. And just like with cattle and sheep shows at agricultural fairs, would encourage people to fill out forms um, uh, and would reward them with, uh, with, with medals and um, competitions, fitter family competitions. And this was the, the basis of them generating data that they would then use in the eugenics research office. This is one of their, their, their departments in order to construct these, these pedigrees. They wanted to construct a pedigree for all Americans. So therefore they could identify the genes as they ran through families and therefore could apply eugenics principles to their work. And indeed they did. From 1907, the United States, uh, with the first legislation was passed in Indiana uh, for the enforced sterilization of people deemed unworthy by society. And over the course of the 20th century, United States, 31 states in the USA it had um, legislation for eugenics. We estimate between 70 and 80,000 people were sterilized against their will or in many cases against their knowledge. And if you think this has gone away, the most recent cases of enforced sterilization in the states happened in 2021 in the ICE detention centers, admittedly far fewer numbers, probably in the in the dozens. Um, but this is something that is ongoing, not just all around the world in, in countries such as India and China, but in the United States. Now, I want to tell for the, for the second half of the last few minutes of this, this, this talk, I want to talk about H.H. H. Goddard, another key player in the eugenics movement. So Goddard was a psychologist, the first person to translate the IQ tests, which had been formulated in France, into English and introduce them to America. The IQ tests under Goddard's watch were used at Ellis Island to select people, immigrants, to deem whether they were deemed intellectually worthy or not of ent entering the company, uh, the country. Um, but that's not what the story I want to tell either. I want to tell the story of uh, Goddard's work of Deborah Kalakak, a seven-year-old girl that he had been treating, that he described as uh, a standard imbecile, a moron, the type of girl that we find in our reformatories. Now, this was the language of, of the day, but it was a, a she, she, she had non-specific psychiatric and mental health conditions that got fell into the category that was generally known as feeble-mindedness. And Goddard set about to try and understand in exactly the way that Charles Davenport had done in the years before and after the pedigree, the family from which she came, in order that we'd understand how this concept of feeble mindedness flowed through families and into Deborah as an eight year old girl. So he constructed an exhaustive family tree that went back right the way uh, um, uh, many generations back to identify the founder of this family a man called Martin Kalakak, who was a returning war hero, revolutionary war hero, who on the way back to his Quaker wife, again, I mean, I think the Quakers are pretty good on the whole, but Quakers seem to feature quite heavily tonight and not in a good way. But on the way back from the war to his Quaker wife, Martin Kalakak stopped off at a bar and had sex with what he described as an attractive but feeble-minded barmaid. And he never saw her again and he returned to his Quakeress wife. But what H.H. Goddard did is track this family and worked out that there was a perfect bifurcation. The family derived from the attractive but female, uh, the attractive but feeble minded barmaid were full of delinquents and people with hereditary conditions. Um, they were diseased. They had, what, again, a term that we don't use anymore, Mongolism that ran throughout their family and were besieged by inherited problems, whereas his Quaker family were fine and upstanding and full of bankers and teachers and were wealthy and upstanding members of the clergy. So he'd identified that this gene ran, the delinquency gene for feeble mindedness ran through this branch of one family as set up by Martin um, having sex with the attractive but feeble minded barmaid. But on the other family, his, his uh, Quakeress upstanding wife, um, everything was fine and dandy. Now, this is, he published this in a book in 1912, which is an international bestseller and profoundly influential around the world in terms of thinking about how hereditary diseases were passed through families. This is from a textbook in, 19, in the 1950s, which shows on the right hand side his, his worthy Quakeress wife and full of upstanding um, uh, members of society, whereas on the left hand side, the feeble minded tavern girl bore a son known as Old Horror. 
Anyway, now there's many complexities within this story and we, the, the whole concept of a single gene, that's my dog downstairs, the single gene um, determining something as vaguely described as feeble mindedness, we now know is absolutely incorrect, not, not a sensible way to understand genetics in the slightest bit. But none of that really mattered because it turned out that the Kalakak family never existed. The feeble minded tavern girl did not exist. And in fact, the family that he was investigating was an entirely unrelated family, unrelated to Martin Kalakak himself, who, who was a real man, um, and was an amalgam of different families, which were, did have some heritable problems within their family, but also had fine upstanding members of the clergy and, and, um, and the teaching profession as well. And in fact, some of the children in the Kalakak family, the diseased delinquent side, had fetal alcohol syndrome. But we, are now, we can now identify that using photos in the original book itself. And of course, fetal alcohol syndrome is not heritable genetically. It is caused by environmental constraints. So it was a fiction. It was, it was not something which was um, uh, correct at all. Uh, it was made up, and yet it was incredibly influential. Now, this is 1912. I'm going to cut immediately to Germany. And this is a tedious academic slide that I use in my lectures at UCL, where I teach. But let's talk about eugenics in Germany for just a second, because it was formulated at the same time in the late 1890s and developed during the first two decades of the 20th century. Interestingly, not anti-Semitic in, in origin. In fact, the idea of Nordic purity was thought to be enhanced by mating with uh, um, Jewish people, Ashkenazi Jewish people, in, in order uh, to, to help Nordic people be more successful. 1920, the concept of lives unworthy of life, Labens and Beth Labens was introduced. And so this, this began the, the snowballing effect that would culminate in the, in, in the po policies of the Nazis in, from 1933 onwards. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the, the, the development of eugenics policy in the States was profoundly influenced both intellectually and financially by the US uh, eugenicists, such as Charles Davenport and the Eugenics Research Office. The Rockefeller Foundation funded several uh, eugenics research offices in Berlin and around Germany until 1938. When Hitler came to power in 33, one of the first laws that he passed with his then absolute power was the enforced sterilization law. And it was directly translated from a law written by one of the members of the ERO, Harry Lachlan, in 1920. And 1939, Action T4 was in, implemented, which gave the framework for ultimately what would become the, um, uh, the termination of many, many millions uh, during the Holocaust. Now, the Nazis were adept propagandists. And in order to pass the 1939 law, Hitler said that he didn't think that people would accept these euthanasia and eugenics policies outside of wartime. And the 1939 Axiom T4 law was in fact backdated. It was signed in October 1939. It was backdated to the 1st of September, which is when um, the Allies declared war. In 1935, um, this, this film, a film was released, a 12 minute film that ran in front of most cinemas uh, most mainstream films in cinemas around Germany called Das Erbe, and Das Erbe means the inheritance broadly. And it's a short film in which a young female student is watching two stag beetles rut, and she calls over her professor, which is in the top right slide there. She calls over the professor and says, what's going on here? And he explains to her that this is nature. This is how Darwinian, the struggle for existence happens in nature, and shows her, sits her down and shows her a film, which includes various things, some, some um, some stags rutting with each other, a cat catching a bird, and in the bottom left, a dog catching a hare. And they're sitting around watching this film and they're laughing and the, the, the student suddenly gets it. And she, she clicks her finger and says, and says in German, oh, I get it. Even nature has its racist policies. And they all laugh and it's, uh, it, it's terribly amusing to them. Now I'm gonna show you a couple of minutes of the film. I hope this is gonna work um, because it's very striking what happens next. So this is a clip and film. There is sound on it, but I'm going to talk over it. So here they are in the cinema with the professor explaining to the students how dog pedigrees work. The hunting dogs have been bred for many years in order to purify their breed to make them better hunters. Now watch what happens now. Die Nachkommen des Leutnants Kalikak, 
aus seiner Ehe mit einer erbgesunden Frau waren alle gesund. So he's des describing also the Kalakak family tree in 1935, so 23 years after it was published. And on the right hand side, that Ebbs ge ge uh, gesunde Frau means sort of healthy, upstanding women. 493. But there on the left, the Erb Heinke Frau, which sort of means uh, her uh, hereditary ill women, and those black dots, the mark of the feeble mindedness pouring through the generations. Ein einziger Erbkranke Ahne hat genügt, um eine große Nachkommenschaft unglücklich zu machen. Der erst gesunde Zweig der Familie Karika hat 493 gesunde Nachkommen. Aus dem Erbkranken gingen 434 Erbkranke Unglückliche hervor. Okay. Dies ist nur ein Beispiel von vielen Tausenden. And then what happens is it cuts to some, some images of people in um, uh, sanatoriums and mental health uh, clinics from around Germany with the bill, the cost to society of maintaining these Lebens und Werte-Lebens, lives unworthy of life. And then it finishes with a quote from Hitler himself, um, uh, which says, who is physically uh, who is physically and mentally not healthy and worthy may not perpetuate his suffering in the body of a child. Now, right, I'll just please stop that because it's absolutely horrific. Um, and I'll stop sharing as well because I think I'm, I'm going to finish there. But basically, this is a, just a tiny nugget of what I'm really interested in, which is how ideas become normalized, how tiny scientific ideas are, um, are co-opted, marshaled, into political ideologies and how a small esoteric academic idea can in only the course of 40 or 50 years result in a pseudoscientific justification for genocide. That's where I'm going to end. Um, and I asked if I would not go last because that's such a miserable story, but it is an important story and to understand the relationship between science and ideology is, is really where, where I'm best placed. So thank you.